Oh, golly gosh, I tell you what, this being blooming, well, I don't know, am I famous yet? It seems like I'm getting famous, it's kind of weird. So they've asked me at the garden club and that went well and then I've blooming on the radio and on the television and now I'm off to the blooming Boy Scouts. So I'm not sure, I was having a bit of a blooming drama in the shower a second ago wondering, I'm not sure where they amalgamated and now they might just be the People Scouts, but I'm not sure. So I'm going to have to find out when I get there. But I found this cool book, which is basically the best history of bees for kids. So I thought that would be really cool for the Scouts and the Cubs. And I'm like, oh, I don't know, anyway, I've got these really cool pictures. And I thought, well, that might be give me something to go with. Save me trying to draw it, because I can't draw for crap. And the wife was looking through it too, and she said, man, we want to get a few copies of that and put it up on the webpage. So people, if they like it, they can grab one themselves. The Book of Bees. And it was written by, and I can't even pronounce his name. So that's pretty terrible, isn't it? Maybe we'll reshoot that so I can practice it. Pai Tor Sancho. Man, that has to be Dutch or something, doesn't it? Don't know. Anyway, it's a cool book anyway, regardless of whether I can pronounce the author's name or not. Off to the scouts we go. But the interesting thing about bees is that they are not interested in stinging you one little bit. People think they've got this idea that a lot of bees are tracking you down and they want to actually sting you and you know, do all sorts of nasty business to you. But if you really think about it, when do you actually ever get stung? Never. Generally when you hurt them, when you tread on them. That's usually a bad option. Well, interestingly enough, annoying the bees is really only if you go to their home. If you go to their home and then the guard bees will go, what the heck's going on out there? Because, you know, and you know why bees are a little bit antsy when the humans turn up? Any clue? Could be the fact that they're protecting their home. But the interesting thing is back, back, back into the whole history of bees. What do you reckon was their primary enemy back in their homeland, back in Europe? One of their primary enemies anyway. Bears. Yeah, you're good. Bears. And what happens with bears? They breathe the same as us. And so when we out exhale... So if you want to upset a beehive, go up and blow in the front entrance and they'll all come screaming out and go, what the heck's going on? So don't do that, by the way. That isn't an idea. That's a bad idea, unless you've got a bee suit on. If you put a bee suit on, you can get all excited. Then you can go playing in their homes. Although, I did bring just a hat. So if you want to just try on the hat, would you youngsters want to try on a hat? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Here you go. Oh. Oh, can I reach? Oh, I've got long arms. So this is a bit of a daggy box that has been around. I think this box is older than me, and I'm about 50-odd. So this box is one of my mate, Les, who's 84, I reckon he is, and he's been beekeeping since he was 12. So how good's your maths? That's a fair while. <laughs> so he's still going. He, reckon, he gives his longevity to the fact he eats lots of honey. So that's not a, that's not a sales pitch. It's just the fact that honey's good for you. It's got lots of micro, like something or others that they talk about. You're, you've got to look that you know what I'm talking about, micro something or others. Anyway, all I know is honey's very good for you. So, good for your throat. I should actually have some when I get home. I brought it. Has anybody seen honeycomb? I was going to bring a frame of honey, which I'll just show you a frame out of this box. If you go into a bee box, you'll see some frames like this and this is just capped off this is kind of cool and the girls by the way there's an interesting footnote 95 percent or more of the population in a bee box are women that's an interesting little thing and for you i'm not actually sure that i want to tell you how the drones actually get raised just for a little time of the year and then they're just kind of kept around just for you know I didn't really know what they kept around for other than, well, you know what they've kept around for, for their part when they're flying outside, but helping out, yes, helping repopulate the planet. If you look here, they make all these little honeycombs, and the interesting thing is they'll actually use the same comb for making honey and storing honey, storing pollen, and making their babies. So they actually have come along here, the queen comes along, and she'll lay a little pattern of eggs, and she puts one little egg in each little pot, which the girls have made. Do you know how they make the honeycomb? Do you know how they make the wax? Any clue? Any guess? 
You're very knowledgeable with your head on. Yeah, it's a good, any, anybody? Nah, I bet you wouldn't. You know, they used to think that they used to go out and collect the wax. Now, that was an interesting thought, because they'd go out to a pine tree, and the bees would be on the pine tree, and you'd get in the sap. But no, the girls actually can make wax by themselves. That's interesting. It is. It's, well, thank you. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. They actually have little flakes, and they roll them up. They make little flakes under here. Then they roll them in a little ball, and then they hand them amongst themselves until they get a big enough ball. And then they start making honeycomb. And then there's a queen. There's only one queen, by the way, and she lays eggs in the honeycomb that the girls make. And then the poor lasses, they have to feed all the babies. And so they've got to get a little egg, a little larvae, and then they feed that, and then they put a cap on the outside of the larvae, and then the larvae turns into a little pupae, 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 like a moth. Same sort of idea as a moth. And then a little bee crawls out. Yes? Big trouble in a little bee box, especially if it's the wrong time of the year. But as a general rule, if she happens to pass away and there's plenty of eggs, the young other, queen, other bees in the box will say, oh my goodness, we haven't got a queen, panic, 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 and they'll run around and they'll find a little egg that's the right age and they'll change what they feed the babies. Because to make a queen, all you've got to do is actually feed it all royal jelly, whereas it's just a worker bee, it gets some royal jelly and some just nectar. So it's an interesting thing. So they're all, well, except for the, except for the drone bee eggs, there's no way they're going to turn into a queen because that could be really weird. But, <laughs> but anyway, every egg to a certain age can become a queen, which is kind of cool. And so the girls can actually make a new queen out of, the, out of the, what's in their box. But if they haven't actually got any young larvae or young eggs, then there's all sorts of strife. Then that's when the beekeeper comes along and he goes, this doesn't look good. So he gets a frame from another bee box and gives the young eggs to the bee box that hasn't got a queen and they'll raise a new queen. Or you can go and buy one on the internet. I didn't actually bring a queen box. That would have been a good question. You can buy a queen in a little bucket, comes in a little box about that big, and she comes up and she has five little friends to help her get fed. And they come here, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria. They fly through the post. It's kind of cool. Takes them about four days in the post. The postmaster rings you up in a big flat. Oh, my God, there's bees in, my, there's bees in the post office. <laughs> but they can't get out. Anyway, so then you've got to come along and then you've got to put them in the bee box. But sometimes, sometimes the lasses in the box do not like the new queen. And I'll just go, no, nope, we're not having her. And then, I'll, then, <laughs> then that's, that does not end well. So then it's most frustrating because you've just spent $35 to get a queen all the way from the other side of the country into your box. And they just go, no, nope, we're not doing that. So that's the thing about bees, is you're not actually doing anything that they don't want to do. They've got a mind of their own. As you can imagine, if you've got 60,000 to 120,000 girls in a box, they're going to do what they want. And so you just got to sort of try to make their life a bit easier. I thought it was, and, by, and you can have a little hive tool. This is something else. I don't think I'm going to hand this out because you lads look like it could be dangerous down there. But this is just so you can get the frames out of the box. So you come to your box, you've got, ah, actually, before you come to your box, oh, I should put this back together and show you what the first thing you need to do before you get to your bee box is you need to get your smoker machine. I'm not going to light the smoker because otherwise the fire alarm will go off and then we'll all be in trouble. But you get a little bit of hessian and you put it in your smoker. Or if I can get it open. Ah, I tell you what, if I was organised, I would have done this before I got here, wouldn't I? Come on, there's a little bit of daggy ass hessian in there. Anyway, you light that up, which I say we're not going to do. And you guys would all know how to light things because I'm pretty sure you do fires and stuff here. Yeah, <laughs> oh, there's a little bit left over, that's pretend smoke. <laughs> so you do that and you come in, you give them a little bit of smoke. And does anybody know why you would give the bees a little bit of smoke? Hopefully not to kill them, that would be a bad option. That's not a good idea. It, calm them down. it does calm them down. And why would it calm them down? Doesn't it make them sleep? It sort of makes them sleep, but what it does is make them a bit freaked out that they think there's a fire coming. And in their natural environment, if there's a fire coming, they'll go to their honey stores and they'll fill up with honey in case they have to flee their home. So then, of course, you know how it feels after you have a lovely meal. You know, mum's made, I don't know, mac and cheese or a decent lamb roast or whatever is your favourite thing. And how do you feel a little bit groggy after, you know, your tummy's full and it's nice and warm and it's like, oh, 
just going to sit on the couch and watch telly and have a nap. Well, that's my age. You guys probably don't do that. But anyway, so, <laughs> so the, they, get, they get a tummy full of honey and then they just relax a little bit. So they're distracted. So that's the first thing that happens. And then, like I said, you have this cool little tool that I didn't actually make. And you can lever the frames up. I've done this before because these are cheating. That's not as easy when this is full of bees. And that's why it's not full of bees, because you guys would probably not be, still be in this room. <laughs> Has anybody seen honeycomb? Honeycomb, honeycomb, yeah? So before it's, before it's messed up? You have? I drank. Have you? Yes. I drank honeycomb milk. What? I drank honeycomb milk. Honeycomb milk? Yes. Okay. I never even heard of honeycomb milk. That's going to be a new product. I'll have to Google that when I get home. Nippy. Nippy's honeycomb milk. Here, give me that now, pass that around now. Look at that. Dear, oh dear, honeycomb milk. And does anybody know who was the first people back in the day when they actually found out about bees? Do you know how they used to get honey before we put them in this little box and we're all friendly with them? Do you know how that used to happen? No? This is something you guys could still do today, and people still do it today. And it's called honey, it's called bee tracking. So you go out to the field, so you go out to the, I don't know, perhaps not in this field, but perhaps next time you're camping, this might be a job for you, Sam, you could actually have a project to make this box up. You make, a, you make this cool little box, and you have two little departments, and you catch some bees in one end, and then you get them into the other part, and then you put a bit of honeycomb in the first catching spot, and the girls will go in and they'll lick up some of the nectar. And then they'll go, oh, this is pretty cool. Then you let them out and they'll fly home. And then they'll fly back again. Because they'll, they'll, when, they when they fly out and they've found a nectar source, they'll fly out and they'll go around in a little circle and so they can figure out where they were. And they'll look at the sun and they'll look at the plants and then they'll fly home and then they'll tell all their mates and then they'll fly back again. And so you're there in the field and then you've, so this goes on for a little while, so you want to have a you want to have an afternoon of entertainment, <laughs> and then eventually you'll get a, quite a nice steady stream of bees coming backwards and forwards to your feeding station, and then about uh, I don't know probably an hour into this madness, depending on how how it goes, you'll walk about 200 meters in the direction the bees are coming. But you guys have got an advantage because I'm pretty sure you know how to use a compass. Yep. Yes, so you could get your compass bearing reading, and you could write it in your book, and then you could. Follow your compass in the right direction. Because sometimes you get a little bit lost when you haven't got a compass. It can get rather awkward. Especially if you've got to walk through a forest or something weird. Because the girls, of course, they can fly over the trees and you don't know where you are. Do they always return in a straight line? Yep, pretty much. Pretty much in a straight line, unless there's, a, unless there's an obstacle. Yep. If there's something that they've got to go around or above, they'll, they'll negotiate that. But as a general rule, straight there and back. They're very efficient. And so then you just continue that, and eventually you'll get to the tree where they were or the bush or whatever they were living in. And that's what our ancestors used to do. And they would actually get the tree and then they would get the, cut the hole in the tree. There's a, actually, I've got a picture of this. This is kind of cool. That's half the reason why I bought this book. <laughs> if I can find it. Where are we? Oh. <laughs> oh, come on, get on with it. If a bloke was organized, he'd have the page marked, wouldn't he? Oh, here we go. So this is when the original farmers, they had holes cut in the tree and they'd climb up the tree and get the honeycomb out. Now, I reckon that would have been rather complicated. And of course, here's the bear that I was talking about earlier. I don't, th I don't think he had it. I think he was cheating. <laughs> but I reckon that would have been a bit of a job and I don't think I would have wanted to be a beekeeper climbing up a tree in that format. That would have been a bit interesting. And the other thing that can happen is when you think about European bees coming to Australia, if, how do you reckon they actually got across the ocean? Flying? No, it's a long way what? from England. How do you reckon they actually, because they're, uh-huh. They hopped on a ship. They did hop on a ship, but they were purposely on a ship. But they first started bringing them on a ship, and of course you've got four months on a ship, and they ran out of food, so they didn't get to, didn't go too good. So they tried it for quite a long time until they eventually thought, what happens in Europe when they're really cold? They go to sleep and they hide in a little bundle. And so they thought, what we'll do is we'll put them in a box. Well, they had them in these skips, which were cane baskets. So they had them in a skip and then they put them in a wine barrel and then they put ice in the wine barrel. 
So then the bees were very cold and they put them right down in the bottom of the ship. And so the bees thought it was really, really cold. So they just hibernated for the whole way across here. Then they got to Sydney and they reeled them up onto the dock and they went, wow, this is paradise. And poof, they were everywhere within about a year or two. There was bees everywhere. <laughs> so I thought that was rather cool. Now, of course, they can just, well, we're not allowed to bring them here anymore because it's uh, diseases and stuff. So we've got our own bees. Any other questions about beekeeping? Would anybody like to be a beekeeper when they go? Or an apiarist, as Sam would call it? I like that. Yes? You're thinking about being a beekeeper? Yeah, I reckon it's, it's not a bad job. It's, it's still pretty physical, though. It's not as, not really that mechanical. You can't sort of just, I don't know, drive past on the tractor. <laughs> you, have to, you have to actually manually do stuff. But they're a fascinating little creature. And the other really cool thing about them is that they're, a barometer of how nature's going. So if you're interested in, in how the planet's getting on, it's a pretty good idea to keep an eye on what the bees are doing because they're very reliant on the flowers and the fields and all the things that, that we're reliant on. And if you're not interested in bees but you happen to like eating food, you probably should take an interest in bees because most of the food you eat that you really like, like apples and pears and almonds and grapes even, most of those are all insect pollinated. So. It's probably a good idea we look after them, I reckon. And us beekeepers, we spend half of our life wandering around the countryside trying to pollinate crops, which is, I don't know, somewhere between crazy and interesting. <laughs> yes? Um, why did the bees go on the ship? Why did they go on the ship? Because there was a beekeeping dude that was in Sydney and he wanted to get the bees that he had at home here, which is a bit like what we did with a lot of things, us Europeans, when we turned up. Uh, let's not bring up foxes and spoggies and what are those swallows? Yeah, anyway, at least the bees were helpful. What's that? Yeah. What's this do? Yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's the suit you put on. Oh, am I going to put that on? <laughs> oh man, oh, see, you get in here. This is when the girls are a bit upset with you and you turn up and you're going to borrow some of their honey. You put this suit on. Oh, if I can get in here without wrecking something. Ooh, mind you, you want to try this on a 44 degree day and see how you get on. It's jolly hot in here. Yep, and then you get the hood. This will make them look like dangerous critters. <laughs> well, uh, now I'm a big white polar bear. Oh, oh. Ta da! And you wouldn't believe it, you can still get stung. Because you get your nose here and they'll poof. <laughs> it's great. Oh, that's a fun, yes, that's fun. Oh, talking about bees in the suit. My poor lovely wife, who does come and help me a little bit. She, had, I bought her a suit and the back seal wasn't quite right. And so we were out moving the bees at night and they all were on her back and then they ran up the back of her suit and in through the little gap that was in there and then they were all inside her suit. And so she's running around the ute and the, in the yard screaming, there's bees in my suit, there's bees in my suit. Ding, ding, and about six things later before she got in the car, Anyway, so I don't think she's been back since then, which was a bit of a worry. I was not a popular husband, but it wasn't technically my fault. I don't think I didn't make the suit at least. Mm. So I don't know, does that make me responsible? I think it does, kind of makes me responsible. Technically, technically responsible. <laughs> yes, there you go. Yeah. yeah, that's the idea. That's what my dad used to have to do because he's highly allergic to them. So when we had them for pollination, he'd have to put his thing, hat on and his little cover. He was most unimpressed as well. He wasn't allergic, except for when he was, a, when he was I don't know, 30 odd. He had, a, he had an old fruit box. You know those wooden fruit boxes that you, no, no, anyway, the apples used to come in them. They were about that, about that big and they were like a half crate. And he had a few bees living in that and they were, the box was starting to get a bit raggedy. So he thought to himself, ah, oh, well, I might just do something with that. So he picked the box up and he taken it to the ute to take to, I don't know why he wouldn't have done it where he was. Anyway, the, the box just collapsed and went Poof. So he was just covered in bees from head to toe. And of course they were everywhere. Now, the interesting thing about that story, I found out not long before he passed away, which I thought was rather interesting. He didn't mention the fact that, he didn't pass away from the bee stings, but he didn't mention the fact that he got really stung because he's stuffing around trying to put the bees back in the box. He should have just run off. If you ever kick a bee box over, just disappear over the horizon and don't worry about it. <laughs> Whoosh, out of there, gone. Don't stick around because they, you know, the first, the first five stings are just the warning shot. Then they go home and get the, get the rest of the troops and say, 
off you go. <laughs> real allergic, yeah, real bad. Yeah, so and unimpressed about beekeeping. <laughs> so. No more questions. Thank you, Mark. Come in and talk to us. Thank you, guys. Yeah, very cool. Thanks for having me.